<laughs> it was an ordinary Wednesday night when Erica decided to take the last bus home. She had stayed late at the office, catching up on work she'd neglected. The streets outside the dimly lit bus stop were deserted, and the only sounds were the occasional distant hum of traffic and the rustling of the autumn leaves. Erica had always felt a slight unease at this particular bus stop. It was an old one, with peeling paint and a broken bench that wobbled ominously. But it was the last bus of the night, and she had no choice but to wait. As she sat on the bench, her phone buzzed with a new message. It was from her friend Julia, checking in to see if she was on her way home. Erica replied with a quick, almost there, and glanced around. The streetlights cast long shadows, and the chill in the air made her shiver despite her thick coat. She heard a noise behind her, a scuffling sound, like shoes dragging on concrete. She turned quickly, but the street was empty. Erica shook her head, trying to dismiss her growing unease. She focused on the orange glow of the bus stop sign, willing it to change to the arrival time. The bus finally pulled up, its headlights slicing through the darkness. Erica stepped on, and as she settled into a seat near the back, she noticed a man standing at the stop, staring at her with an unsettling intensity. His face was obscured by the dim light, but his eyes seemed to bore into her. When the bus started moving, she took a deep breath and tried to calm herself. She glanced out the window and saw the man still standing there, watching as the bus carried her away. The hairs on the back of her neck stood up, but she tried to shake off the feeling. The bus journey was uneventful, and Erica felt some relief as the vehicle approached her stop. She exited the bus and walked quickly towards her apartment building. As she fumbled with her keys, she glanced over her shoulder, half expecting to see the man from the bus stop. But the street was empty. That night, Erica's sleep was fitful. She kept dreaming of a shadowy figure following her, his presence growing closer until it was suffocating. When she woke up, drenched in sweat, she tried to convince herself it was just a nightmare. The next day, she returned to work. Everything seemed normal until she found a note in her office mailbox. It was written in a shaky, almost illegible handwriting. I promise, I'll get you the next time. When people see me, Marjorie Evans, they see a very attractive woman with it all. A stable job as a dental office manager, a handsome boyfriend named Luke, and a charming penthouse apartment in downtown Chicago. But behind this facade of perfection lies a darker reality. Luke and I have been managing our secret operation for over a year. By day, Luke is a talented photographer. By night, he partners with me in a deceitful scheme. We run an online romance scam where I go by the name Nina Vixen. I craft alluring, seductive profiles to ensnare unsuspecting men who believe they're conversing with a genuine romantic interest. They pay us a flat fee of $1,000 per month through my Cash App account for my exclusive attention as their cyber sex doll. Clients also send me additional money and gifts via a P.O. box I rent in a neighboring city. Our rule is to maintain distance, never get too personal, never meet in person, and always stay just out of reach. Until Michael came along, we had managed to keep our online personas separate from our real lives. Michael was different. His profile claimed he worked in cybersecurity and enjoyed white hat hacking. His messages were poetic declarations of love, expressing dreams of a future together. Persistent yet respectful, he showered me with expensive gifts and heartfelt notes. Luke was skeptical from the start, but I dismissed his concerns, convinced it was just another infatuated client. One evening, as I read Michael's latest letter, I noticed a peculiar detail he mentioned a surprise but didn't elaborate. I laughed it off, thinking it was another romantic gesture. That night, an uneasy feeling gnawed at me, disrupting my sleep. 
The next day was my day off and with Luke out on a photo shoot, I was alone in the apartment. As I sipped my coffee, I heard three sharp knocks on the door. My heart raced. We rarely had unannounced visitors and Luke had said he'd be out all day. I crept to the door and peered through the peephole. A tall, bulky, middle-aged man I didn't immediately recognize stood in the hallway, Michael. His face was set in a determined grimace. Panic surged through me. My phone buzzed with a message from Michael. I'm here, can't wait to finally meet you. Frozen, I weighed my options. Ignoring him might provoke his anger. Opening the door could be dangerous. My hands shook as I scanned the apartment for something to defend myself with. Another series of knocks shattered my indecision. I dialed Luke's number, my fingers trembling as I held the phone to my ear. The line rang endlessly until Luke finally answered, his voice strained. Hey Marjorie, what's wrong? Luke, you need to come back now. Michael is outside, he's at the door. There was a heavy pause. I could almost hear Luke's heartbeat through the phone. Stay calm, I'm on my way. Double lock the door and don't open it. I slid a top bolt in place and peered through the peephole again. Michael was now pacing furiously, his face twisted in rage. Grabbing my cell phone, I moved away from the door and pulled up the Ring camera app. I watched him, his anger palpable. Minutes dragged on. My mind raced with terrifying possibilities. How did he find me? How did he know my real name? Was he dangerous? My phone buzzed again, another message. I'm not leaving until I meet you. I love you, Marjorie. We're meant to be together. The pounding on the door grew louder, reverberating through my skull. I pulled a butcher knife from its stand in the kitchen, my hands trembling uncontrollably, and pressed my back against the wall. My heart pounded in my chest, fear nearly suffocating me. Michael's pounding intensified, his voice booming with fury. Marjorie, open up! I know you're there! Minutes felt like hours as I waited, the sound of Michael's relentless banging echoing through the apartment. The pounding suddenly grew more violent. He was kicking the door, slamming into it with terrifying force. My breath caught in my throat as I heard the door frame splinter. Finally, I heard sirens in the distance. The pounding slowed, but Michael's muffled shouts were still audible. The door was barely holding on, the wood splintering with each kick. With my ring app, I saw Luke arrive, but he was not alone. He had brought a friend, a burly man who looked ready for confrontation. They talked to Michael, trying to calm him down. The police arrived shortly after Luke and his friend and the scene was chaotic. Michael's rage was still palpable as the officers restrained him and led him away. I could barely process what was going on or how he managed to breach building security to make it this far. I opened the door and Luke pulled me into a tight embrace. Are you okay? He asked, his voice trembling. Luke, I was so scared. He almost got in. I thought he was going to break through. Luke's face was a mixture of relief and exhaustion. We called the police on our way here to get him to move along. They warned him that any further contact would be considered harassment. A police officer interrupted us to ask us both questions. My relief was overshadowed by a deep, persistent dread. Our world had shifted irrevocably. The carefully constructed facade we maintained had been shattered, and the risk of exposure had never felt so real. That night, as Luke and I sat together trying to process the day's events, I realized the fragility of our safety. We had built our lives on deception, and even the boundaries we thought were secure could be breached. Luke got building maintenance to replace our door and door frame that same day. As I pulled it shut and locked it, I glanced into the darkness, half expecting Michael to be lurking in the shadows. Would he dox me? Would I get swatted? How did he figure out who and where I was? Would we have to move? How had he gotten past building security to my front door? A thousand unpleasant thoughts and questions raced through my head that required immediate answers. 
The encounter left a chilling reminder that no matter how tightly we control our lives, the consequences of our actions are still inescapable. The knock at the door had stopped, but its echoes would haunt me for a long time. My name is Bill Jenkins, and I never expected that a night of heavy drinking would lead to the events that followed. My property was loaded with stray cats, so I didn't need another mouth to feed, but the urge to goof around became irresistible to me. It all began one early summer evening when my drinking buddy Iron Bear and I were sitting on my back patio, laughing and swigging beer. Iron Bear, eyes glazed and speech slurred, stared at the darkening sky and noticed a large group of crows circling above. Mama Crow, he yelled at the crows. Look at those crows, he chuckled. They're like a goddamn army or something. I squinted up. You know what would be funny? If we caught one and trained it to be a pirate's parrot. Just imagine it perched on my shoulder. Iron Bear burst out laughing, slapping his knee. Yeah, right. How are we going to catch one of those crows? We eventually decided to rig up a crude trap with a cardboard box, string, bait, and a stick. The next evening, to our astonishment, we actually caught one, a huge, magnificent bird with glistening black feathers. Its beady eyes seemed almost intelligent, as if it knew something we didn't. It seemed more interested in cautiously hopping towards me than following the chunks of bread beneath the box. Iron Bear impatiently grabbed it and shoved it into a plastic cat carrier we had on standby. The crow initially squawked in surprise but said no more. It didn't even struggle against its tiny jail. We spent the next few days trying to teach it tricks. Our attempts were feeble but kept us entertained. Then things took a darker turn. The fifth night, I had a nightmare, surrounded by enormous crows with glowing eyes, suffocating me with their presence. I woke up drenched in sweat, heart pounding. Iron Bear had a similar dream. We laughed it off, attributing it to beer and late night munchies, but the nightmares persisted. Soon the crows outside grew more numerous, filling the trees and sky, their eerie cawing omnipresent. It felt as if they were watching us, waiting. On the seventh night, Iron Bear passed out drunk on my couch. I stayed sober keeping watch over our captive crow. It had become increasingly agitated, scratching up my wooden coffee table with its sharp talons. Unbeknownst to us, it had pecked through its hemp rope and was now free. As I dozed off, I heard a sharp screech. The crow was attacking Iron Bear's face. No, I screamed, rushing to intervene. The crow was relentless, having already pecked out one of Iron Bear's eyes. I swung a rolled-up magazine at it, but the crow dodged and quickly escaped through a gap in the window. Panicked, I tended to Iron Bear's gushing wound, calling 911. He wailed in agony, blood splattering his shirt. Days later, the murder of crows began to leave. Iron Bear returned from the hospital with a black eye patch and facial scars, ironically resembling a pirate. The sky seemed emptier, but the incident left us both wary and shaken. A week later, I sat alone in the backyard, drinking, trying to forget the vicious attack on my friend. I felt strangely detached from reality. Out of nowhere, that vile creature reappeared, landing directly in front of me. Its beady eyes locked onto mine, making my skin crawl. It raised its wings high and let out a loud, piercing caw before hopping three times and flying toward the upper branches of a neighbor's redwood tree. I felt an ominous dread wash over me. The next day, I decided to clear my head with a bicycle ride, desperate to escape the haunting memory. I rode for several minutes through empty streets, and then I looked up to see the crow perched on a telephone line watching me. Distracted by the bird, I didn't notice the car speeding toward me until it was too late. The collision was sudden and brutal. I felt a jarring impact, and then everything went black. As I lay there, lifeless on the warm asphalt, I realized that my life had been just a fart in a hurricane compared to the spiritual significance of crows. My crow had not just been a plaything and a nuisance, but a harbinger of death, appearing in my life to warn me of my imminent demise, 
a cruel twist on our earlier foolishness. 